Hello and welcome to the Events Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Taylor, and each week I talk with event professionals about how they plan, promote, and run their events. Well, this week, I'm actually currently in San Francisco, California, where I came across for Google Next, which is a huge Google Cloud event, which I'll talk about in, in a minute. But I'm currently, I'm staying in the Mission District, which for anyone who's been to San Francisco, it's a cool area. You know, it's, it's obviously a bit hipster like everywhere now, but it, it's still got a bit of the old San Francisco here, there's a Hispanic community, a lot of like murals on the wall, a lot of cool cafes and food. I went to a great breakfast place this morning and got, got a bagel and, and a cafe latte. So sitting in an Airbnb, I, I think I mentioned before, I'm really a fan of, of Airbnb. I've kind of figured out, I think at this point, how to sort of spot the good places. I mean, it's nothing that's really rocket science. It's just looking generally for places with a lot of reviews that are quite established. And I stay in hotels all the time, but I, but I really like hotels for kind of one to two days. Anything more than that, I really love getting an Airbnb and getting a bit more into the life of the place. So I've been here for four days. It's been a real flying visit. I came across on the weekend, I met up with a couple of friends, Roland, good friend of mine from Santa Cruz, California, who's a big surfer down there. And we've run events all across the world together. We've had a lot of adventures. We've even been to the demilitarized zone across the border into North Korea. So it's great to catch up with him and his wife and, and a good friend of mine, Owen, who used to live in, in Prague. So I had a day kind of decline, you know, decompressing and meeting some friends. And then I've been at the Google Next for the last three days. And I'm actually going there today for the morning. And then I'm flying back to Prague at three o'clock in the afternoon via Paris. So it's been a really kind of busy three days. The scale of a Next event is really like nothing I've seen before. I, I guess you'd call it a convex, a conference and an exhibition. Um, there's something like 30,000 people here. So the main event is in the Moscone Center, which is quite famous for where Steve Jobs, uh, I believe, un unveiled the iPhone and did a lot of the Apple announcements. But it's not just a Moscone Center. I mean, that's already a huge kind of several city block area, but there's multiple hotels all around San Francisco where events are hosted as well. So it's, it's a bit disjointed. Honestly, it's a bit too much sometimes because you have really kind of strict security checks. It's like going into an airport, you know, with all the scanners and taking everything out of your pockets and you're going in and out of these places all the time. And lunch was crazy. I mean, I just gave up because the queue was too long to even get something. But, but it's been cool. It's good to see an event on this scale. And obviously, we're a Google partner, so it's good to be here. We had a special partner day on a Monday just, just for the education partners in the hotel, the Landmark Hotel, really top of a huge hill in San Francisco. I didn't realize when I looked at the map, I kind of, you know, it was a few blocks away and actually it was a, up a super steep hill. So it's good to get some some steps in. That was great. All in all, it's good, you know. There's a, there was a huge keynote yesterday. I mean, I'm guessing several thousand people in, in the room. A lot of announcements. Uh, and then, you know, kind of walked around the exhibition area, met some sponsors like Acer, met the Google Education team, and went to a few sessions. So it's, it's been good. A lot of networking, a lot of talking, but ready to get back to see the family uh, later on today. So on to today's uh, interview. This was with a guy called Jethro Bins, and he runs a squash membership site called squashskills.com. So it's really interesting. I've never spoken to someone who runs a membership site before, which is, you know, you have a site built around an interest and people pay you a subscription. So, for example, $50 a month to get access to videos and content and a community. And it's really good. I'm a member of this site. I've recently got really into squash. So it was fascinating to talk to him about how he built this business and how he made it profitable really in, in the first month. And there is an events angle as well because Jethro runs squash coaching camps all around the world. So he kind of uses, his, he leverages his, his membership site to, to also run in-person events and they kind of complement each other. And in addition, he's also a DJ and does a lot of promotion of electronic music. So we talk about that. He has a night called Just just Jack, which is one of the longest running nights in Bristol. And it, I think it won some DJ awards certain years. So it's good to talk a little bit about music promotion as well, which is a topic I'm, I'm fascinated with. So really, really good interview. Just remember that our podcast is sponsored by uh, Events Frame, which is a system I co-developed. It's a really amazing ticketing system. If you run any kind of events, I'd love you to check it out. We've got plans starting from around $39 a month. A lot of new features coming. We integrate with PayPal, Braintree, Stripe. Really amazing system. We've spent years working on it. We've got a lot of huge events and small events running it. So it'd be great for you to check it out and help support a growing business, taking on big companies like Eventbrite. So really hope you try it and have a good week, everyone. And here is the interview. Hello and welcome to the Events Podcast. I'm Dan Taylor. Today on the podcast, I've got a really interesting guy I've been following online for a while, Jethro Bins. He's the founder of a membership website called squashskills.com, which, which I've recently joined. They've got loads of great content, which you can see on YouTube. He also runs coaching camps, squash coaching camps all around the world. 
uh, all around Europe at least, which is really interesting. So that's kind of the event angle. Uh, and he's also a DJ and runs music events. So I want to get into that. I'm fascinated by the music world because I'm kind of on the fringe of it. So, so Jethro, huge welcome to the podcast. Hi, Dan. Great to, uh, great to be here with you. Cool. So, Jeffrey, a bit of background as to why we're talking. Like, I've recently become obsessed with squash. <laughs> it's kind of it weird, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. I never liked it when I was young. I always thought of it as a very corporate, you know, business person's game, you know, when I was young. I, didn't, I, didn't, I was always into, like, skateboarding, and I'm, I'm still into, like, snowboarding, mountain biking, all the kind of outdoor, you know, more, like, freeform kind of, kind of sports. And then what happened was just, I've got a bunch of, I live in Prague and I've got a bunch of friends play and I just went along for the Wednesday night and like, I just really got into it. I thought this is just like, you know, despite what, how I kind of perceive the image of the game, it's just a really cool, you know, it's like playing chess with an incredibly hard cardio workout as well. So I just, I just love it, you know, and, and now I've got, I have a coach twice a week. I play in a league. I've got my iron doing some masters tournaments. So yeah, that's, I got into it and that's what drew me into your content. Yeah, it can do that as a sport. It kind of hits a lot of spots, doesn't it? In terms of every element of fitness is covered. It's pretty gladiatorial. Uh, as you say, within, within 45 minutes, you get kind of a a crazy workout um but it's got that competitive angle uh, which you obviously don't quite get in the gym so and the ball keeps coming back right compared to yeah. something like tennis it you know it, it's pretty constant um you know it's funny you describe it as chess i often think it's kind of chess cross boxing yeah with a racket you know it's it's so physical it's so gladiatorial you're in this kind of four walls but you know, you're not actually hitting each other, which is, well, if you're doing it right, you're not hitting each other. Well, but you uh, do get, I mean, even like, even in the year I've been playing, you know, I mean, I play a lot, I'm playing at least four times a week, and you do get, you do get taken out once or twice, you know, like, I, I don't think you can play a squash of any amount of time without getting hit in the head by, by your opponent at some point, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you, as maybe as you get a little bit better, that should happen a little bit less frequently. Yeah. But yeah, it definitely kind of gives you, you know, you can see why people get obsessed with it, because it does just, it gives you that, that endorphin rush, obviously, I, I, the back of the exercise but then you've got that competitive element there's genuine joy when you you don't do win a match and that you know you can constantly keep learning um, you know i'm still learning now and have been playing for 28 years and you know i'd like to see myself as a reasonably experienced coach but you know there's so many subtleties to the game that it just it kind of constantly keeps evolving actually you look at the way the game's been played in the professional the way the professionals are playing it now it's it's different to how it was 10 years ago and it's different to how it was 20 years ago and it's certainly a lot different to how it was kind of 30 40 years ago so yeah constantly evolving fast paced and um, you know pretty dynamic so lots to lots to enjoy about it and the thing i like that kind of surprised me you know i, I mean I, I guess i'd hit the ball around when i was young but i really you know i'm in my 40s and i just started playing it and and i, I was pretty fit you know i crossfit and, and things like that but but i'm amazed how quickly i'm improving and so like you know in prague for example there's like 22 22 leagues in this in this kind of division and i started off at the bottom and i'm, I'm already in 12 you know i've got a good chance of getting into the top 10 this year you know which is, means i could start in playing in the in the national league the, the bottom <laughs> national league and i'm i'm amazed that i'm beating people um you know 20 25 years old just by having that just just even i'm just getting the basics of always coming back to the tee playing to the back corners i mean it's it is a sport you can take up later in life and if, if you're pretty active you, and you've got some hand-to-eye coordination you, you can learn it quick which surprised me a lot yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's about accuracy, right? So if you can put the ball accurately into a certain part of the court and you can um, remain in control of the middle and control of the tee, you can make somebody do a lot more running than you. So you, you can play smart or you can, you know, if you play stupid and you're just running around chasing the ball or you're you're on the end of the rallies, it's, it's going to be hard work. But actually, if you can play with a bit of accuracy, tie your opponent down in the right part of the court, then you can get on top of on top of people you know so um, as you say a bit of hand-eye coordination and a bit of game sense and you know access to a great membership membership site that tells you how to play exactly and, which uh, we're going to get onto <laughs> so tell me a bit about your background how did you get how did you end up becoming a, a professional squash player what was the um did you just play it a lot as a youth and you were you just happened to be the best in your club and then you you, you took it to the next level no uh, i mean i started off when i was about seven um and was very fortunate a good family friend of ours was uh was a professional coach up in london so he kind of took me under his wing um from from you know as soon as i started and then we got involved with the Welsh setup at nine uh, and then became, was Welsh national champion at kind of every junior age group. 
uh, so under 12s, under 14s, 17s, 19s. And um, and it just, you know, as I got got older, I stopped playing other sports around 15. As I got a bit older, it was like, oh, that's a professional squash is definitely an opportunity. And then decided to have a gap year, so I went over to South Africa between school and university. Trained like a pro for a year and thought, actually, right, I'm going to go to university. But, you know, the, the goal is assuming I can, you know, maintain the trajectory that I'm on, we'll, we'll give it a go. Um, so so came out of university, um, having, you know, joined the tour for a couple of years, had an OK ranking through uni, and then got some lottery funding and, th- and then went pro. So, you know, I was lucky enough to be supported by Wales um, with, with, with the funding. Uh, well, yeah, some funding through, through juniors and then, yeah, into the early senior careers. Um, and then, yeah, went full time. <clears throat> Uh, on the PSA and, and played pro for a bit um, before, unfortunately, it all just went went a little bit wrong. But, yeah, I mean, before we get into that, like it's 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 funny because you know, just I just know a sport, you know, just from doing the sports I've done it. It's just it's a pyramid, isn't it? You like it's it's so hard to move from one level to the next. Like you know, to be a good club player, then to be a good regional player and professional, and even and when you're a professional, like to to get to the next level. I mean, I, I was I actually met a guy last week, Daniel McBib. I don't know if you know him. He's a Czech number one, and he's a professional. He's around mm-hmm. that top hundred, and he was saying just like how competitive it is. Uh, you know, there's the, the Canary Wharf tournament, which we he, he almost qualified for but didn't. You know, and it's like it's and he's like an amazing player. You see him, and you're just like this guy's unbelievable. But even if for him, it's like he's at the next level when he's got a it's all just a little little changes that could make him beat the guy who's 10 places above him in the rankings yeah, yeah absolutely it's a game of fine margins and if you can do you know certain elements of the game better than another person you can you can get on top you know it's incredibly physical fitness plays a huge part in it um maybe less so now maybe it's kind of leveled out a touch maybe everybody's standards have, have jumped up from when i was was playing 10 years ago but yeah. you know the the pace and the intensity that you're able to play at uh does does dictate uh, a huge amount but then you'll see you know, ball skill and, and control at the top level obviously is uh, is crucial as well so it is it is fine margins but yeah going from uh you know that average club player to a pro it, it can be can be quite a, sh- a step up and a, and a shock and it can look easy can't it when you yeah. watch somebody who really knows what they're doing just being in control of the tee and then that other person who isn't isn't quite as good you know, just the, it's like you, you're able to read the game. The more more time you spend on court, the easier it is to read the game, know where the ball's going. So you step into lines early, you take the ball earlier, put more pressure on. The more pressure you put on, the easier, you know, the, the less shot options your opponent has, the, the yeah. quicker you, so you can accumulate and just get on top. So, um, yeah, there's there's fine margins, but to kind of, you know, make those significant jumps is definitely a challenge. Yeah. So, so back to your story, like, so I don't know if you can talk about it, like, like what happened? You said, you know, disaster struck, I guess this is like one of these TV shows when dis- the, 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 <laughs> yeah. the sort of the moody music starts playing and disaster struck, like what, what happened? Yeah. Well, I, it's funny. You look at, look at the time it was a disaster. Looking back on it now, it's probably a blessing in disguise. Sure. Um, so I was playing in the world university championships in Egypt. I was playing in my Mossad uh in the quarterfinals and um i just i slung, went for a ball that i shouldn't have been going for actually in the in the front backhand on a slippy court and um it was it was rolling out of the nick as well it was just ridiculous even trying to get it out um but in in doing so it did, kind of did the splits uh but it was a dusty court and my front foot just kept going so i ended up tearing my um hamstring oh. clean off my pelvis <laughs> you just tore it off yeah oh my god yeah so an avulsion tear so um yeah it it's just ag- agony at the time got wheelchaired out of the hospital and um yeah, it was quite funny an egyptian doctor at the time came to my room and she said oh you have a torn of your hamstring and gave me two pills and said really this, this one for the muscles this one for the torn tomorrow you walk the next day you'll run <laughs> and um I didn't, yeah, I didn't take the pills. <laughs> You're like, I'd like a second opinion, please, a different doctor. Yeah, I just put myself on a flight back home um, two days later. And I mean, maybe I should have taken the pills. Maybe I would have been walking and running rather yeah, than having an operation and um, seven months out of the game, which is what it was. So I'm bionic now. I've got um, a metal a suitor in there um, that they kind of had to cut me open and reattach it. And um, yeah, it just meant that it was frustrating because I was kind of the biggest mover in the whole world at the time for that year uh, on the on the world tour. I was kind of 80, 86, I think, in the world at the time. 
um, and, and heading upwards. And then off the back of that, yeah, seven months out. And the following season was was really frustrating. Um, I actually had a really good t- first tournament back. I beat world number 49 in San Francisco. And so, like, oh, you know, back. Um, yeah. But then just you can imagine having one hamstring that's effectively a bit tighter than the other for the next, the whole next season. So my hips were sore, my back was sore, everything was just a bit out. So just ended up hovering about 120 in the world for the next, the next year and ended up losing my lottery funding. And then in doing that, it was like, right, well, let's have a look at coaching, moved to Bristol and started coaching. We're still on tour, played one more tournament in Ireland um, before kind of saying, you know what, I think it's going to be coaching now. And you know, playing professionally is no longer really an option. It's tough, you know, it's tough as it is. So as soon as you lose, lose that lottery funding, it becomes even tougher. How many people would you like? How many squash players in the world would you say make a living just from playing, like a full time good, good living? You know, comparable uh, to having a good job. In terms of like what would kind of living wage, I guess, in terms of UK, maybe I realistically you've got to be top forty or fifty to be making that. And then right. as soon as you're below the top fifty in the world, you're you're scraping by, you know, yeah. there's plenty of people living, still living at home or, you know, they're, not, they're certainly not putting a lot away. Um, yeah. So it's, it's top, I mean, it's got a hell of a lot better. Don't get me wrong. The, the world tour has done wonderful things in the last few years. And, you know, we just saw the million dollar prize fund at the world champs. So those top guys are actually earning some really good money now, but once you kind of get below top 50, you know, it's, it's quite hand to mouth. And, That's incredibly uh, competitive. You think how many people play squash in the world? Like to have a chance of making it a living out of it, it's it's almost impossible, isn't it? I guess. Yeah, yeah it's it's a challenge, and it requires dedication and hard work. And I mean, that's fundamentally what it's about. You know, um, you look at the top, some of the top guys in the world, and I hope you know they won't mind me, you know, name name referencing them. But players like you know Paul Cole, Nick Matthew, um, you know, not not necessarily renowned as the most talented of of squash players but they've got this mental strength and this work ethic yeah. that that's the key bit that gets them to the top it's that ability to push themselves harder and harder and you know remain focused that that's you know that determination grit is actually what gets you to the top you can be as talented as as you want but if you're not prepared to put the hard yards in then it becomes uh you know, really, really difficult. Yeah, Paul Cole, I like especially because I, you know, like I told you, I've been doing CrossFit for quite a few years now, and uh, he's he's big into CrossFit, you know, and it's it's good to see someone who who's using that to benefit his squash as well. Yeah, no, well, that documentary we filmed with him um, not yeah, long ago is it fascinating, and um, you know, he does it in a smart way. Um, you know, it's all squash specific and picking the cherry picking the elements of CrossFit that work for him. Um, but yeah, just an amazing athlete, and you know, shows what can be done. You know, he. Um, he said, you know, in his World Juniors uh, under 19 that year, he he lost in the round of 64. Um, so it was, you know, certainly not a top junior. But then, as I said, just goes to show what hard work and dedication can do Definitely. to go on to become, you know, just broke top five in the world this month, didn't he? So, um, cool. Oh, really? Good. Hey, so I'm really, because for me, you know, I run, uh, I think, I don't know if I mentioned it, I run a couple of businesses one is a, I have, we have our own ticketing event management system and I, I run an events company you know we run events for Google so a lot, we run a lot of you know my business is basically an online virtual business you know I'm in Prague our team is around the world and and you've founded a business squashgirls.com which is a membership site and I guess this came from from your coaching so I'm keen to know how this how this started you know yeah well it was kind of around the time of uh, you know recovering from that injury and that that kind of slack year um I was living, I was actually back at home with my parents, saving the pennies, and there was a family friend back there who, um, he'd come across a, a website called Fuzzy Yellow Balls, or it was a YouTube channel, actually, and it was some some collegiate uh, tennis player doing some online tennis videos, and he uh, he was like, can't, can't we do this for squash? Can't you do it? And um, I said, well... Maybe I don't know. I haven't, I haven't got much experience in front of camera. He said, "Well, come on, let's let's give it a go." So um, started. Yeah, we we had, he got access to a camera and started recording some very very ropey videos uh, with some very very ropey presenting for me. So bad that it got. You know, I was having. To, I had a can of Stella uh, just out of shot to try and help me relax and get my words out. Um, so we ended up with these terrible videos and kind of just played around with the idea um 
And Peter Nicholl, who's world number one, uh, was actually managing my sponsorship at the time through, or former world number one, uh, was managing my sponsorship uh, through Prince. Uh, so I was in touch with him, said, well, would you mind doing some coaching videos uh, for us? We've got this concept. He said, oh, it's a brilliant idea. I'd love to. So we went down to Canary Wharf, um, got, I don't know, it must have been about 20 or 30 videos with him out the back of Canary Wharf. And then seeing him deliver the content was like, oh, God, this, you know, it'd be great to have Pete involved. So we offered him a stake in this concept. And um, and then from there, it was a rocky road, actually, that next period. Like, we had this had this idea, didn't really have any money, uh, ended up actually falling out pretty significantly with the family friend. Um, he was trying to, you know, take it in one way, and we were actually looking at, I think always it was a disaster really... doing business with family friends, you know, like, you know, it never, <laughs> yeah, it never ends well. No, no. And, um, yeah, we ended up selling water, trying to sell water and electricity to squash clubs rather than focusing on creating squash coaching videos. So yeah. it got to the point where it's just like, look, this isn't working. Um, and he, he kind of bailed, handed his shares to Pete. And, um, and then I said to Pete, look, I'm, I believe in this. I think we can do this together. I've got a little bit of inheritance. I'll buy a camera, get some kit, I'll put some money into the website, let's make it happen, and, and Pete was up for it. So so we then decided to crack on with the you know, with the membership site. So, so what had you done with your initial video? Did you just stick them up on YouTube or did you monetize them in any way? Uh, did you get paid? No, we we started there was a bit of a Facebook uh Facebook page going, I was chucking some tips up, a little bit on YouTube, just started building a little bit of brand awareness, I guess. But, you know, in hindsight, looking back at them, they weren't great. They were just terrible, really, really bad. But um, actually, at the time, you know, they did. there was nothing out there, right? So this was 2011, 2012. Raised a bit of hype as well. I did at Canary Wharf. I did a world record attempt of figure of eight volleys standing on a on a Swiss ball. I don't know if you ever saw, saw that video. Yeah, I did, yeah, yeah. Um, so that, that kind of helped kick things off with squash skills as well so there were yeah, a few a few little tips and then we put money into the website like two thousand pound website initially we budgeted for which so you, you, you didn't hire you just you just paid paid someone you outsourced it to a, to a company uh, or an individual you didn't yeah. hire a developer or anything no i mean it, it, it crazy kind of completely bootstrapped and found an agency um the website ended up costing about six grand in the end yeah i think by the time we got start to finish um and mark who who did it with us um the developers come on to be a good you know a good friend um but it was all kind of pulling in favors in bristol at that time i was quite involved with the music well yeah as we discussed or um, mentioned i was involved in the music scene here in bristol and pulled in a few favors and connections so had some creativity or coming from the kind of the designers and the web developers that we knew through through the music scene there so yeah kind of put this date of july the 2nd 2012 as the launch date raised a bit of hype through social media and and then yeah went went for launch and 40 i think 40 odd people signed up on the first day which at the time was you know we were charging about 100 pounds or 100 pounds a year for annual memberships lots of people were doing that so suddenly you, was, yeah covers your almost covers your web development costs yeah, too, yeah. It was, at the time it was just like oh my but how God, much content dude. surely to go live i mean that's the thing you know i'm only going to join a site that's got a lot of content like how much when you went live like how many had you spent like weeks recording videos or were you pretty light and just promised you'd do more um, we launched with a hundred videos, so I mean, it was literally me sat on a laptop with these with these poorly shot videos that were then being edited in a really bad way by me. I think we had like mountains in the intros, and it was it was very much mo- i movie. Um, so we we properly winged it. I mean, the filming doesn't take the time; it's the editing that sure. takes the time. Right, you can film a chunk of uh, coaching videos pretty quickly. So yeah, we had a hundred at launch. Um, and then so we, I think we were putting one out a day. We committed to putting one out a day throughout that period. Um, and then as, yeah, as soon as that first kind of 4,000 pounds came in, it was like, okay, there's potentially merit in this. There's something in this. And, you know, then you realize that there's lots to do with running a startup. And rather than me being a video editor, I literally put a, um, post up on Facebook saying, does anybody, anybody want to come and do some work? Again, through the music channels, got a day's work tomorrow, does anyone want to come in? And, uh, and this chap, Rory, he was a student, said, oh, I'd love to come and do some work. So he came in, no video editing experience, kind of pointed him in the right direction. And, um, and that was how it started, really. So we, 
genuinely winged it, found a niche where nobody was doing anything, actually did it badly, but filled it reasonably quickly. And then the quality of the content was poor, but the people that we got involved through Peter Nichols' connection, because he was a business partner then, you know, one of the world's greatest squash players, had lots of friends who were top 10 in the world who he'd come up with, started filming with them. So the, the credibility kind of came through those connections. Sure, um, sure. And then we started getting access to squash TV content, which is, you know, the output of the world tour, um, you know, good connections there. So we were lucky in the sense that we definitely didn't do things in a conventional startup manner, but through the connect connections we had, we got the credibility we needed to then establish ourselves as the kind of go-to online coaching platform. Um, so we did that for a couple of years and then, then raised in 2015, raised some seed capital, rebuilt the website new platform which is the current site that you uh, that you see today um and kind of learn as we went along really um yeah here we are cool um now what what's your process now do you because I'll, I'll talk like for me that you know this podcast it's a side project but I, I i had so many false starts in podcasting because i was doing all the editing and all this crap but like now you know i've, I've got i've got a uh, team in the Philippines. If you want any advice on, on building a team in the Philippines, I, I can tell you everything about that. But uh, now I just record the podcast. I stick the link in the Google Doc, record an intro, and then that's it. Bang. That's somebody, they make a graphic, they, they edit the podcast. Like, uh, do, do you have a process like that where you just record a video or you get someone else and someone else takes it, you know, edits it, you know, curates it, puts the text, or do you get involved yourself with, with all that? I am still a little bit involved. So we've got a team of four full-time in the office in Squash Skills. So there's a videographer and editor. You actually um, have, you have a physical yeah. office, do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, old so, school. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we, we, yeah, we've come a long way. So we've got a growth team, so we're two full-time, and then a, somebody working on strategy and the marketing kind of two days a week. Gary heading up fitness he works a couple of days a week. So yeah, very much a team and, and delegation now. So, you know, I'm kind of working as a CEO, I guess, trying to focus on, well, at the moment, it, we're looking at launching an app. So it's, um, it's product development for me and then, you know, around content. But, but now really, I'm trying to outsource as much of that as possible as well. Um, so, you know, it's definitely about trying to remove myself from the day to day and get out of the weeds. Um, and focus on working on the business rather than in the business, you know? It's funny. That, that's, that's definitely my, where I'm at. I mean, you know, there's so many different things. Like I've, had, I've bought and sold a couple of businesses. I've bought, I've built, I've started and, and, and founded and sold a couple of businesses. And I, I used to have a business with a physical office. I had like 15 staff at one point. And I, I personally, I hated it. Maybe it was because the business was up and down. It wasn't in gray. I, I didn't like the hustle. And so I, I deliberately set out like these businesses to be, just virtual, you know, I mean, I, I have an office here in Prague, which is, I've got a cool place and, you know, and it, it's, it's, but it's my kind of little kingdom. I hang out and other people don't come here only occasionally. Everyone else is in, in, in the UK, in the U S Philippines, Thailand, uh, Peru, like we're all over, you know, but then mm -hmm. sometimes I think, well, actually I miss having, it'd be nice to have an office and hang out and talk and go out for lunch together. I, I mean, there's no right solution. You know, I'm, st I'm still not sure. I think on balance, I like the virtual and then just organizing meetups, but I think there's a lot to be said from having an office from just productivity sometimes yeah yeah absolutely i mean we're very lucky i see it's more of an extended family to be honest um we we've also got malcolm who's my um my my dog so he comes into the office with us so there's kind of four of us in there full time and you know i, I have a home office as well so if it doesn't make sense to go in then i can just get my head down here but you know, I, I don't dread going into the office at all. I actually love it. I mean, we're still a small team, you know, in that sometimes there's five, five or six people in, but generally it's, it's four of us. We're all friends. We all take the piss out of each other. We all have a laugh. And, um, you know, it's very relaxed. We're down to a four and a half day working week now and just trying to create a kind of a great culture where, you know, if work needs to be done, it gets done. But if, um, it, you know, I don't want people just, just sat behind a desk because they feel they have to be sat behind a desk on everyone to have reason to be there and then, you know, enjoy coming into work. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, culture obviously plays a huge part in, in how enjoyable the office environment is. Definitely. Uh, I mean, I think that's, that's the key. I mean, I think if I had an office here again, it'd be like, almost like more like a co-working space. People can choose to come in or not, you know, if we've got a meeting, they come, but otherwise they can come and work part of the time or work from home, work from a cafe, you know, mm -hmm. 
I didn't like having the nine to five thing because I, I, I'm a very kind of erratic worker, you know, sometimes I'll get into something early in the morning and I'll chill out, you know, I go and play squash during the day, you know, a lot and then, or I'll do something in the evening and I didn't like that attitude when everyone was in at a certain time and you're looking at people saying, are they working or not? You know, that, that's what I didn't like, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, of course, of course is, isn't it? It's, um, I, I don't mind. I think I've kind of, I convinced myself that that's what I should be doing. And now yeah. I'm trying to, to find a bit of balance. You know, I, I certainly give myself flexibility. I think, you know, the, the staff, they, they, they seem to appreciate doing their set hours, but I think they also appreciate the Friday afternoon off now. And, you know, I'd love to get down to, to a four day week. Um, but you know, as long as that degree of flexibility is in there, somebody has got an appointment or they need to leave early or they want to make up time. You know, it's absolutely cool. And that's the, the luxury of having this, this small team with, you know, the, the, it, it's like, we treat it, as I say, like a family. So everybody has this desire for the product to succeed and, we're all in it together, which which just means that no one's ever slacking and nobody's ever trying to skive off. It's just not the, the mentality anybody cool. has, which is lovely. So, so how quick, how how long after starting it did it become like um, a full time job where you were like, this is actually making me me an income? I guess you're still coaching. I guess you, you kept the coaching going because it, it feeds into the video. But I guess like, how long did it take to get to like, okay, this is actually giving me a, a real income? Um. <laughs> It was pretty quick in the sense that I was working with Hadrian Stiff at Elite Squash and I was on a kind of a, a set amount each month, which you know certainly wasn't a crazy wage at all. But almost within two or three weeks of launching, I I said I said to him, look, I think this this is what I want to focus on, and then was just supplementing um, supplementing that coaching. Sorry, uh, supplementing the, the work with some coaching. Yeah. So I was taking a salary pretty quickly. You know, it became very apparent that there was a ton of work to do, and said to Pete, "Look, I'm, if I can take some money out, um, it was a small amount, but at the time I was used to being, you know, had been a squash player, and was used to not earning very much. So we kind of, you know, we were wing it, and it was a case of looking at the bank account, like, oh, can we pay this this month? Oh, can we do this? And we had, we actually borrowed a little bit of money off of father-in-law to to get us by for one little patch, and then there was a bit of a bank loan, and you know, it, it was it was very hand to mouth. Sure. Uh, but you know, the beauty of a subscription business is it, you know, you keep adding more members and more more monthly revenue comes During in. Growing revenue is the holy grail of of business. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. It works really nicely. Um, but yeah, it just became apparent, you know, with, in hindsight, you know, I would love to have gone out and raised early on and, and had a bit bit more of a buffer, spent more money on a website or a better website, you know, given myself and Pete a salary early on, got some better camera equipment. But, you know, we've t our journeys, it's taken a, a lot longer than, you know, perhaps it, it should have done or could have done. But we're still standing, you know. I think just being a seven-year-old startup, <laughs> yeah, you know, we're, we're not technically a startup, but we have a startup mentality still. Is you know, is a good thing. Um, I, I know. I don't know if you, I think you did it the right way because I've 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 done businesses like you. I've well, even even more extreme than you. I mean, I've never even taken bank loans or borrowed money. I've always just done it all myself and suffered and not paid myself for a couple of years. And you know, mm -hmm. and, and what you end up with with that kind of business is you own it all. Like, I mean, if you take funding. That, that's not free money, you know, like it, it, great, it's great you can pay yourself a salary in the beginning, but then that, that's a person who owns a big share of your business and they're harassing you and they want you to go to this direction and that, that money doesn't come for free, you know, like, so that's really the other thing you've got to remember. No, for sure. Well, we, we, we raised in 2015. Yeah. Um, so we ended up giving 12% away um, at the time, which it was, it, you know, that's not enough to feel significant board pressure. Or, sure. It wasn't a, a, a crazy chunk, so actually it worked out pretty well. Um, and we built the brand and, and built this foundation of a business, which meant that we could raise a, a decent valuation without, you know, rather than just being an idea, we'd kind of prove concept and prove it worked, or proved it worked, um, which meant that, you know, we, we are where we are today and cool. you know, still with major or majority shareholdings in the company, which is great. Great. Now, now, how did like how did your live training events um, fit into fit into squash girls? Because you you run these weekend camps, which I, I've been checking out. I may even come to the Berlin one actually, because it's not too far from Prague. How uh, how how did that start? Um, I think it was just 
we got to the point where the brand was was so it was you know big enough we had a wide enough reach that it was just like it just felt like a logical next step um you know people were appreciating the videos and it was like well you can kind of come and meet the coaches and let's turn it into a fun weekend so yeah just just thought we'd test the water really um where was the first one we did the second one was in birmingham i've got a feeling the first one was in Guildford. I guess you had an audience from from the website. That's how that's how you managed to get people to come. Who were people who were already subscribers? Yeah, and and social media. We had a pretty big social following, so it was just a, yeah, about organising the event and 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 testing it out, um, putting it out on the social channels via email, and um, yeah, yeah, people came. So we we aimed for uh, twenty four people per camp. We wanted to limit it to to no more than four people per court. Um, we decided that we wanted to give the the best um, kind of adult coaching camp experience that there was. Um, so we, we charged quite a lot, um, but we wanted to make sure there was plenty of value and everybody was well looked after. So I think there was a, you know, if you look at the States, there's, there's big, big money to be made in the US uh, junior coach, summer coaching uh, programs. You know, people are charging an absolute fortune with the the kids who are looking to go and get into Ivy League schools. You know, they take up their their summer coaching program and and they'll pay a lot of money each each uh, each week that they that they attend. But the adult camps weren't really that well catered or aren't catered for on a global scale. And obviously, our core core demographic and core audience was this was this adult. Uh, market, so we thought, well, let's uh, let's see what happens. So we launched a couple of UK camps, um, went well, uh, and you know, I guess we've learned. We've done a lot of them now, and I think everyone get, gets a little bit better. You learn a bit more. Um, so we did. Uh, we predominantly focused on the UK for the first two, three years, and then we, you know, our second biggest demographic is in the states. So we we've done a couple over in Yale. Um, then we we've done some in Amsterdam, Berlin, uh, Poland now. So it's just you know the, the model doesn't really change. Um, yeah, got yeah. a core, core team of coaches. You know your expenses go up a little bit as soon as you go overseas. But it was just about you know there'd been a great opportunity to to go and meet members. Yeah, I mean, I was curious. Do you make do you make money from the events? Because I mean, you say your prices are expensive, but I, I think they're pretty cheap from in terms of what I. You know, a lot of sporting events. I guess it's more expensive than a basic sporting event, but it's still not. It's not a crazy price. I mean, is is it a is it a community builder? Or do, I mean, I, I guess you make like a, at least a decent profit on it. Yeah, the, yeah. The man, in the grand scheme of where, where the business generates revenue, it's not that much. Yeah, it doesn't affect the bottom line a huge amount. Um, but they're they're good weekends for us as coaches. You know, we, we get paid reasonably as coaches, so it can be a little bit of money, extra money uh, for the coaches. And then there's a brand fee for the company. Uh, as I say, it's good exposure. It's a good chance to to get feedback. So, I think maybe in the early years, uh, they were a good opportunity to generate some extra extra cash flow. You know, because the money came in before the events and. Sure during lean periods in the summer if suddenly you've got two or three camps in october and people are buying in during the summer it was an opportunity to put a few extra grand in the bank but now with the subscriptions where they are that's that's less relevant so i think they supported the business in the early days uh, or or the earlier days Uh, and now they're just you know more of a fun weekend and a, a community builder and a chance to to meet everybody if that makes sense yeah it's funny like i'm really interested with sporting events uh, i've never run i mean I, I guess i've organized a couple of like touch rugby tournaments and just snowboarding you know kind of jams but just just social ones really and it, it's it's a big business i don't know if you listened i've got a really interesting interview of a guy called chris robb and he's an expert in mass participation sporting events really big big scale ones you know he founded singapore marathon sold it to Ironman. You know, done some huge things, and mm-hmm. and it's amazing on the bigger scale. Like it's big, big business for sporting events. You know, you don't you don't realize. Like, I mean, most people think that, for example, marathons are just charity events, but actually, like, take the Prague Marathon. It's it's one Italian guy who owns it completely. It's his business, you know, and he makes oh. like millions out of it. You know. Yeah, no, that's. I think there's probably an opportunity within squash or around squash coaching, squash education for a much larger scale event, which I think a squash festival, if you will, if you like. There, there, it's something that needs to be considered. It's, um, 
again, it's about prioritization and, and, you know, distractions, I guess the core part of our business at this stage is really growing the subscriptions. But, um, true. I, mean, I, I think Mark's, especially I think myself, you know, masters events are huge and that's a demographic that has generally got money and there are, there are, I mean, I'm looking myself at doing some masters events, but there's, you know, I think there's a gap in terms of like the not, not the top, top level, but like, you know, medium to, you know, good, you know, club kind of players who people will travel to another country for a weekend for a, for a big social, social networking and squash kind of tournament. I think that kind of thing could be interesting as well. Yeah, no, without, without doubt. I mean, there's lots of people probably running, who, who have much more experience of running. I wouldn't know the first thing about running a squash tournament. <laughs> I can run a coaching camp. So, yeah, I mean, the Masters events, definitely, they seem incredibly popular. Um, and I, I'm sure there's something to do around coaching. Um, it's just a case of, of finding the time to focus on it. As, you know, every hour you spend focusing on definitely on one thing means now another hour you're not focusing on the, the core of the business. So it's, um, yeah, about prioritization at this stage. But, but the events have been great. You know, we have a really core, core demographic, or not sort of demographic, a core group of players who who attend, um, you know, will end up on the other, well, <laughs> we've had people travel in as far from, you know, from Australia, from Tokyo, from Canada to London for a two day camp, which just, you know, blew my mind at the time. And then we'll travel over to Berlin and, you know, it's five or six Euro- uh, British players who attend every camp in London who are suddenly there in Berlin or they were there in Poland. And it's, it's just nice, you know, I think that kind of community family feel is, you know, at the core of squash skills and, that that certainly co- you know, happens at the, at the coaching events as well. Which Definitely, is- you should take a look look at Asia as well. I mean, I, I do a lot of stuff in Asia, you know, Google Google education stuff in Asia and. That's a place where squash seems to be booming, you know, definitely. So that, and I'm sure you could get a, an event in Hong Kong or somewhere like that would get a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. It makes it makes loads of sense. The only the, the cost of getting a lot of getting all your coaches like, out there, I guess. Yeah, that's that's our biggest expense. So um, we're looking at doing another US one. Uh, the in in the fall or in the autumn um so but you know you suddenly it's it's 2k before you even uh, even get there you know by the time you book the flights for for four coaches so it, it does eat into your bottom line and adds that kind of degree of risk and that that break even point jumps up significantly but yeah. um, it's yeah. it's funny you mentioned about the the the, the ivy league thing it's it seems like it's it's, it's really like being good at squash is something that'll, that'll help you get into one of these skills, which is really something I would never would have known before I started playing. Yeah, well, it's about being a rounded, a rounded person, isn't it, in the States? Right. And uh, you've got to kind of tick off your community stuff, your education, your sports. So, um, And then I think, you know, ultimately, if you're, if you're one of the best squash players in the country and then you get scouted, then your SAT score can be a bit lower if you're going to be on the varsity team and the coach kind of gives you the nod and so I mean for their parents and they're spending a fortune on coaching over there you know there are kids who are having two three coaching lessons a week at 150 200 dollars a lesson um you know there's there's coaches that are just hired solely by families and paid a very substantial salary just to look after one family you know and often get housing and board so you'll you'll see a lot of a lot of coach uh, ex-professional players moving out to the states post post psa and um you know helping these kids get into school so it's not about getting on the world tour for those kids it's literally their world championship is getting into that ivy league school it's and funny often- if you've been following this scandal in the u.s now but i think it's hilarious so this this kind of fixer guy who was getting all these children of wealthy individuals in, into colleges and on on like you said you know it's all about you know the well-rounded stuff but but they were literally did you see they were making fake pictures of putting them in the rowing team and stuff you know like <laughs> did, even photoshop pictures of showing them doing all these things and it was uh, i don't know if you saw that but it's hilarious to look at yeah no i can believe it having been out there and coached over there it doesn't it doesn't surprise me at all um but yeah different world over there uh in terms of uh you know the ability to earn money as a squash coach um, yeah. but yeah absolutely fascinating and terrifying at the same time <laughs> yeah sports coaching's funny i mean my, my only experience is is being a ski snowboard instructor you know which is very much a lifestyle mm-hmm. job you know my, my squash coach is a cool guy. he's a subscriber actually to your uh, uh lukash i'm sure he's listening he's a subscriber to your to squash skills 
as a coach. You know, his whole attitude with squash coaching is, you know, he's a young mid twenties, but he's saying, look, you know, I'm gonna. He, he was on the Czech junior team, but like we talked about, it's a pyramid, and it just, you know, he just wasn't good enough to get to the next level. But he's a great coach, and he's just using it for because he's getting great business connections. He's getting into different things, and it's kind of that's his his idea is to do the squash coaching, and then you know, with the people he works with, you know, try to try to get the next stage going. You know. Yeah, well, that was it. It was part of the reason for committing to squash skills. You know, I spent a long time stood on a squash court uh, as a player, and the idea of standing on a squash court. You didn't court, want to waste all that time you'd spend on a. 40, 50 years. Yeah, you know, running around a squash court as a, as a you know, 55, 60 year old is, uh, is challenging for yeah. seven, eight hours a day. So uh, it was about exploring those other opportunities and finding them. And, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely thing to do. You know, you're helping people get better at their passion, right? But um, also it's, you know, a tough, a tough way to make a living as well. It is. I mean, that's like, you know, the thing about squash is like, if, if you can just avoid messing up your knees, messing up, you know, there's a few key things that get a lot of people, you know, and I think I'm trying to, especially getting into the game later, I'm just being really conscious. I want to, I want to have the longevity and not just mess myself up from it, you know, which, which you can do. I've seen a lot of people do it. Yeah, no, without doubt, you need to, need to take care of yourself and do plenty of strengthening and, um, but they do, you know, it's, it's a healthy sport as well in yeah. lots of, you know, obviously there's impact. So it's about maybe minimizing your impact when you training for squash you know you're going to get enough enough impact when you're actually playing um but you know maybe avoiding the the running and uh, and the court sprints I maybe mean, jumping on the bike and that low impact stuff but you know it does it does cover everything you know you're remaining mobile and flexible and you're getting down to deep lunges and you're strengthening and you're you're remaining powerful so it's certainly a good thing uh for your fitness but definitely also, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm probably, if anyone who's not into squash is probably going to be at this stage of the podcast. Like, but I just, just this, I, I'm not, I noticed, like, you, you're right, because like CrossFit, you do a lot of lunges and things. And I think that's the thing. If you, if you train things like that all the time, build the leg strength, build the muscle memory, and, and, and also just don't slam your feet down the side. I think you can just not, you, you can easily avoid not messing yourself up in squash, I think. Yeah, no, I think so. I think so. It's, uh, well, it's about learning to. The, the the smoother your movement and the more fluid you are, the more effortless you make it, the, the less stress you're gonna put on your body ultimately. So the more 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 videos you can watch on squash skills about about uh, getting that fluid movement, the the longer you're gonna be playing for. Yeah, it's funny, like it's a general life thing. I've been trying to focus a lot on my life about not you know, because I I recently had a child and I got married and you know, just my whole life's become a bit more serious than it used to be. I kind of had a very prolonged adolescent for like 20 years <laughs> too long, you know. And now, like, the good thing about your website and a couple of others, uh, business-related ones, is like, if I'm going to mess around and watch YouTube now, like, I'll watch, like, for example, your, like, Squash Girls, because it's, it's entertainment, but I'm focusing. I'm thinking, actually, this is something I could do. Like, I've, I've, I've got myself away from just watching crap that isn't, you know, isn't going to have any benefit on my life, you know. And like, and, and the good thing about having a hobby, you get like, like I told you, I've got kind of obsessed with this recently. The good thing is, it's it's great for me because I can just turn my brain off my business. And when you when you're an entrepreneur, you know this. It's really hard to ever turn your brain off. But if you've got something else, I just go and play squash, and that's it. That's all I think about, you know. And then I can come back to my business, and I've, my brain's been off it, and that's what I really like about it. And it doesn't have to be squash, like any any hobby that you can do that can get into that deep flow state where you that's all you think about is is really beneficial. Hundred percent. You, um, if you, yeah, if you're in a in a tough squash game, you're not really thinking about anything else, right? It's uh, you're thinking about surviving. You're thinking about how much it hurts. You're thinking about how much you want to win. So you can just shut out all that stuff that's going on, you know, outside of the squash court. And often, you can, you know, as soon as you close that door, then you're 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 into a different world. And it's um, yeah, it's lovely. It's just great for that. Absolutely. Definitely. Look, just to finish things off, I want to just change tack a little bit. And we we talked before on the podcast about some of your music stuff. I know you DJ and run some electronic music, and that for me, uh, it's fascinating. I'm I'm kind of obsessed with music as well. You know, I've done a bit of music promotion, really a bit. I mean, you know, we've got a group of us here in Prague, but to be honest, we do a lot more talking on our WhatsApp group than actually doing anything. We go to a lot of gigs. We've kind of dabbled in promotion, but I, I love it. You know, I, I'd love to do it more. It's just finding the time. So I'm curious, like, to see how you manage to juggle it, you know, doing your promotion. So with, with your business, so just, I guess you could start by saying like what you do in terms of the, the music stuff. We have club night called, called Just Jack. Uh, we actually just hit our 13th birthday, um, which 
in electronic music feels like you know it's quite a quite a milestone i guess that not many people end up promoting for, for quite such a long period of time um i actually got involved when i moved to bristol so around that injury time um so the guys were five been going for five years and um they were kind of getting a bit fed up with it and needed to restructure and i just uh, moved to the city the guy who I was living with was doing a bit of DJing and I thought oh, I really want to get involved with this I love the city and just got you know I was into partying and thought right let's I'm going to become a DJ so started um started DJing a bit running my own night and then became incredibly sociable for you know Friday and Saturday every weekend it seemed to be just after I'd stopped playing and uh, then got asked to join the Just Jack collective so they went from three to to five of us and um, at that time, we were doing events for, uh, you know, up to about a thousand people, I guess, twelve hundred people. Um, and then, yeah, in that period, we just we just took it. Um, I mean, the biggest show we did was probably about three thousand two hundred people. Um, so doing, we were probably doing ten, twelve events a year at our leading festivals, and you know, we 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 went off to space and took took over the room in um, not actual space as in space be club clear, yeah. um so we took over the terrace there and did just jack there and um lots of festivals in croatia um but yeah primarily running out of a club in bristol called motion uh, which just got according to dj mag just got voted the 11th best club in the world now um so, so is, is the business model for that like you you just paid it you just rent the club you paid them a fee and it's your event you charge tickets you do all the yeah. promotion it it was it's actually actually changed recently um, more in line with other commitments that that we have so actually moved to to more of a brand fee model um, uh, over the last couple of years but yeah certainly what, what, what does that could you say elaborate what does that mean like a brand fee model so as in uh, the club just pay us a, an annual fee to host the events ah, so promotion actually shifted to to being on them. Um, and we're saying, well, well, we'll we'll book the artists, we'll you know construct the lineups, we'll do the production, we'll book the production in. But the brand had kind of become so strong, uh, I guess nationally really, um, that you know we were in a fortunate position in that we could command a decent brand fee, uh, and then take the promotional stress off ourselves with you know on running squash skills. So, so we've been in that for a couple of years, um, that model. But previously, it was yeah all about the club. We'd pay the club a, a bit of a brand, sorry, a higher fee, uh, relatively small actually. But we would take the we'd take all the tickets, and then they would take all the bar. Um, and that kind of, I mean, to be honest, that worked much better um, because the onus is on us as the promoters to get people through the door. And you wake up if your ticket sales are behind, you wake up in a cold sweat and yeah, you go yeah. promoting, you know. Whereas the model now is less of the onus is on the promoter it, you know, and the club has to do that, that work but they're running you know 20 events a month whereas we just had you know one event a month so or you know one every two months one every three months so the onus became you know it was firmly on our shoulders to to wake up and sell those tickets how, how does it work with working with the djs like are you working with djs at the level where you deal with with an agent and you have to negotiate because that's that's what i'm because I'm, I'm very selfish i'm interested here we've we've done a bit of dealing with bands and and you know I, I find it's very strange because when you're an established promoter i guess you've got more direct connections but with us it's always a case of you speak to the either the tour manager or someone connected and it's very difficult to get like the band to say okay we want 3,000 euros or we want 5,000 it's all about you know they're saying what's it, you know they they're saying to you okay what's the venue size whatever ticket sales they're just trying to negotiate it as much and I don't know how how, how do you find that works is, is with the DJs and, and, yeah, and any I, tips for dealing with promoters as well <laughs> um, I mean much um, much the same really in in the they 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 like to work with an established brand um they know what they're going to get they know it's going to be professional they know they're going to get looked after so if you kind of haven't got much of a history of throwing events it becomes more challenging you yeah, know yeah. if they're getting people want to book them and they've got two offers on the table and one's with an established brand then you know it might be more likely to you, know, you might be more likely to go with them um so yeah there's obviously negotiating we've you know been in in negotiations with you know someone like Marcel Detman, who's one of the biggest techno DJs in the world, you know having a booking at Fabric, 
in London, one of the biggest clubs, you know, most famous clubs in the world, and then trying to shift stuff around. So they're moving fabric dates to accommodate us. And, you know, it is, it is a negotiation. It's about developing a good relationship with the agent. Um, you know, you once you, you know who you're working with or the, the types of people you want to be working with, you know, you, you're booking other people on those rosters. So those those relationships naturally develop. I mean, I wasn't the booker within Just Jack. Um, Tom Tom head, heads that up. So it's about building that relationship with the agent and the agent trusting you and knowing that, you know, if, if their artist is coming, they're going to get looked after. It's going to be a good gig. It's going to be a good crowd that, you know, um, the ride is going to be good. The equipment's going to be good. The sound is going to be good. Sure. You know, so it's it's multi layered and multifaceted. And you know, you if you're competing against a a festival that weekend, and you know, the offers might be much much larger. So there's there's negotiating to be done, and then you can meet it looking to try and double up on gigs. You know, often we'll have an act playing for us twelve till two, and then they'll be playing in London at four o'clock. You know, so they're in and out doing two gigs in a night. And doubling up on the cash, but you know, just... and I've heard if you can get people, especially, I mean, bands specifically, what I'm talking about, you know, punk rock, rock, they're on tour. If you can try to figure out a night in between concerts when they've got nothing, you, you can get a better deal because they're on tour anyway, and they need to fill the nights up, you know. Yeah, of course, um, and you know, midweek midweek bookings of DJs become you know certainly much cheaper. I guess you know, I guess there are more gigs week with kind of rock indie rock 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 acts, whereas electronic music, you know, those big big late nights into you know into the early hours tend to be more weekends. So, but there are sure. certainly deals to be done and you know obviously student parties and things going on uh within the week. But yeah, slightly different um slightly different models. But there's you know there's definitely deals to be had and negotiations to be done. But um, it's about finding, you know, building that relationship with the um, with the agent is 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 core cool, definitely. It's, yeah, it's funny what you said. Like you got this guy Tom, and he just deals with it. I think that's a key thing for us or for anyone doing this is like if you can partner with someone who who is good at building these relationships because you know it's really hard to do that as a very much a side project, you know, because people, you know, it's a whole skill in itself dealing with these people. I think, and if I think a better thing for us is just find someone else who's great at dealing with these bands. Do a partner with them, someone you trust, and or oh, just pay them a fixed fee, whatever you know, and do it that way. I think it could be a better way. Yeah, for sure. It's either yeah, you either outsource it and find a booker who's got relationships, and you develop the relationship with the booker, or you decide one of you is going to become the booker and and puts the hard yards in. But it's it's an amazing. You think it's kind of an easy thing to do to to kind of book somebody, but then you see the email threads. And oh, you yeah, know, I don't think it's easy. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. Yeah, rather rather Tom than me, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, Jeffo, that's really interesting chat. I think we should we should we should wrap it up there. Thanks a lot for your time. Is there anything else you want to promote? Obviously, everyone should check out squashskills.com if you play squash. Anything else you want people to have a look at? Um, no. I mean, just the events. We're we're coming to Berlin uh, next month for the for the squash camp. So any squash players that are up for up for that um that's going to be a, a wonderful um, wonderful event in a, a great city with lots of great music as well we're actually staying on till the monday to go and enjoy the uh, electronic nightlife afterwards but yeah other than that just yes yeah, squashkills.com there's lots of lots of useful coaching tips on there and lots of stuff to improve your improve your game are the for your squash camps like what's is it do you have a range of levels or do you need to be at a certain level to attend one of these no, it's generally um, we have people from beginners all the way up. We we make sure people get on court with people of a similar level. Occasionally, right. you get somebody who's a slightly lower level than than others, but you know we've never had a situation where we've not been able to to make it work. So yeah, Great. full spectrum. Jeffro, thanks very much. All the best. Cheers. Do you want to sell more tickets to your amazing events? Events Frame Event Ticketing has been built to minimise the amount of time it takes to buy a ticket. Result, you sell more tickets. Check out eventsframe.com 